Is everyone excited? Day two is about to start. Everyone excited? Yeah, looking forward to today. Good day yesterday. All right. Let's make a start. I think we're, uh, we're going to struggle to get any more people in the room anyway. So let me just restart my uh, little clock. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank all of our supporters, all of our session leaders, all of our volunteers who helped make this event successful. Without them, this, this event isn't possible and uh, certainly not as affordable as it is. So a big thank you to all of our supporters. Value stream mapping. Uh, can I get a, a show of hands if you've seen a value stream map or you kind of know what one looks like? That's a good portion of you, so that's excellent. Hopefully we can uh, move through some of the early stuff fairly quickly and I can focus more on where I went wrong and, and how you can get better. Uh, do we have any project managers in the room? Hands up if project managers. It's a good portion of you, that's, that's great. Uh, some of my, my best friends used to be project managers. <laughs> so, <laughs> So they're, they're not, not project managers anymore, or they're not my friends anymore. Uh, let me tell you about my problem. So my problem was uh, from a traditional development team, we started to do Agile, and I noticed that our, our Kanban boards started to look very much like a waterfall pattern, um, and it wasn't really helping, uh, mostly because we weren't even looking at that stuff because we were too busy focusing on our daily tasks and what's important to me, and we kind of ignored all the other stuff. And so there's a lot of problems and challenges. Um, I, my background is in software testing. I've been doing a lot of uh, leading of manual testers mostly. But whenever we have a development team, even if they're doing testing as part of that development team, testing, particularly the manual testing, was always occurring one task after the development had been coded. And we were often usually one sprint behind. So we often had problems, the, even uh, the, the, the environments weren't the same in development and production. We had delays getting things set up. The architecture had to go back and re-clarify how that was going to work. The requirements weren't always clear. And we were just missing this other big picture, especially at the feature level. No one, I don't think, was even tracking this at the feature level. We were too busy on our own daily tasks. And I could see there were some bottlenecks here, but I don't think anyone was looking at them. Now, Kanban boards are great for us to spot the bottlenecks. We can see stuff piling up you know, between, between the columns. Even when we're using whip limits, we can see stuff piling up. But we can't see other types of waste in the system and how it can get better. So what was the problem that I was trying to solve? Well, a lot of my challenges in testing weren't necessarily optimizing the testing activity. It was caused by the requirements aren't quite clear enough. Uh, there's bugs in the code. The coding quality is not, not up to scratch. There's other security performance issues. So, my problem wasn't really within testing. No, I'm, I'm sure there was stuff in testing, but my main bottlenecks were caused by the result of other teams. So this was leading me down a path of trying to help solve this problem. This led me on to looking at value stream mapping. Learning to see uh, was written by uh, Mike Rother uh, about coming up to 20 years ago. It's focused on the manufacturing industry and um, Karen Martin recently, uh, well, 15 years later, wrote a book. That's the, one of the only books that I have found that is focused on the office and service in, uh, environment. Most of the books on value stream mapping are still in uh, manufacturing or even manufacturing development cycles, not software development cycles. I bought one book with that mistake, learned, learned that one. So I, I'd recommend um, Karen Martin's book. There is an, an appendix at the back that talks about software development. Um, but it does talk mostly about applying value stream mapping in a service or office environment. So everyone's seen something that looks a bit like this. Most of you are nodding. Okay, so this is a manufacturing model. We've got some suppliers coming in and trucks going out and then all, all of these uh, uh, processes or departments, groups along the bottom that are uh, processing our inputs and creating some outputs at the end. How does that look in software development? Now, at a high level, I've made up these, uh, these teams. This obviously looks a lot like a, a waterfall team where we might have started uh, a few years ago. The idea here is we might collect some, uh, some data and figure out by the metrics that we're collecting that there are these bottlenecks, and I can perhaps now see them because I've got numbers, so I'll try and see where those, those issues are. Where are we slow? Why is it taking so long to get stuff through this system? 
I can now see at least maybe there's some problems here with our solution the architect has to keep going back to, to get clarification about how it's meant to work. Maybe there are the development teams are just causing a lot of uh, challenges for our testing teams, causing a lot of uh, bottlenecking and delays getting uh, all of our quality through that development cycle. So we might then decide to merge some of these teams together and we call it a, maybe a scrum team or engineering team that includes testing and includes solution architecture. Maybe we'll now have a backlog refinement uh, team who are pay taking in the, uh, the items from our project management team. There's someone who's missing here though. If you remember who, who, who's missing, there's a key person, a key stakeholder in here who's missing. C customer. The customer is missing. I'll explain why in a couple of slides later. But I'm looking at focusing on our, our, our flow from our requirements coming in across to our production and getting them deployed out. When I reach this state, maybe there's another, another target condition that I might see after that to make even this uh, better. I might start to see, well, now the bottleneck is in production. And actually, that project management team, they're no longer providing the same level of value that they were. Now we've reached this highly optimized uh, way of delivering our software. So we might then have another cycle where we have a, a future state that looks more like this, where we have a DevOpsy engineering team that can create the code and deploy it into production without needing a handoff to another team. And we'll get the end user feedback with telemetry data, which will feed straight into our refinement sessions. And we kind of cut out some of those other processes that really now weren't adding as much value now that we've improved our processes so much, so much more. Makes sense? So, so this is timing, this is a lead time and a, a cycle time or a process time. So we're seeing how long does it take to get something through that process or through that team. Okay, we'll touch on those uh, later on. We're trying to understand how we can use that and, and what data we, we need to capture. Okay, so I do want to try and move through this, this intro sequence reasonably quickly. It sounds like most of you have got some understanding of uh, value stream maps and I want to focus more on how we can get better and, and some of the mistakes that I made trying to put these together. Okay. I do recognize that we can't just go straight into these end states. We may need to go through a transition state here in some sort of agile team before we can get to this, this end state. And the, the purpose of these value stream maps is not to try and merge teams together or, or to remove a team. But they, uh, there's certainly huge benefits if you can do that. The main reason we want to create these value stream maps is to get this big picture that teams weren't necessarily focusing on before. And we want to see where we've got waste and how we can improve that with some of the data to help make better decisions. The real value, just like a user story, the real value in value stream mapping is the conversation we have creating that map. Just like a user story, the value in a user story, um, as a user, I want some, some, something so I get uh, some value. It's the conversation you have creating that user story is the value you get from doing these value stream maps. Okay. I was still stuck, and it wasn't until I started to reread uh, Toyota Carter, also written by Mike Rother. Hands up if you've read Toyota Carter. Excellent, a few of you. Wonderful. Okay. <coughs> Toyota Carter is a book about continuous improvement, and it goes through the pattern of uh, plan, do, check, act. It goes through a whole series of ways to improve pretty much anything. That's not a manufacturing uh, book. It will apply to any any industry, any team. If you want to get into continuous improvement, highly recommend if you only read one book, uh, the book on the right-hand side, Toyota Carta, is a fantastic book. But going back to reread it a second time, I started to join these two pieces together. The Toyota Carta explains that there's multiple levels at play. You may have an organization level and a value stream level, which is where we're focused today, and then a process level, getting into the real nitty detail. And the target condition from one level becomes the group direction for the next level down. And value stream maps are one of the layers in the, the full organization, value stream and the process level. That, that took me a long time to try and actually recognize and draw these distinctions between these different levels. We'll go and touch in a, a little bit more then about what that might look like when why I've drawn those diagrams the way I had. At an organizational level, maybe at a global enterprise company. We've got global business teams, regional business teams, this technology, project management piece in the middle, some other marketing uh, and sales teams 
at the end. So this may be at an organizational level, we're looking at the real big, big picture and seeing how long between now we're coming up with a new initiative and a new idea to seeing it out the door in each of the regional teams. The, bit, the piece in the middle, the, the technology project management, that might feed down then into a strategic value stream map where we're looking at the things between different teams. This is still between different teams, not between different disciplines. It's, it's a handover between the teams. The development team in the middle, we might drill down then into the lowest level, the process level map, with about 20, 30 maybe little notes of all of the different steps. Each of the, the pink squares on here is a step or a process, some activity that that team does. So it's quite similar to a value stream map, but we draw it out in swim lanes, this time with the disciplines within your team. So each team will obviously draw different things. Maybe you've got a, a development and a testing team combined and you've got a, those skills together but a process level map gets into the nitty gritty detail. Still using some of the similar metrics, process time and cycle time, you plot it out on a timeline and you have a conversation to understand where are the bottlenecks within our team. Okay, back up to uh, a value stream map. It is a, a high level, uh, a bigger picture. These are separate teams where we have handover, where hopefully most of us were a few years ago in a more traditional way of working, hopefully we've moved a bit beyond there to the next uh, transition state where we've combined some of those teams together. Okay, any questions so I can, before I move on? Cool, okay. So let's figure out then how to remove waste and how to get these, uh, these diagrams progressing, how we figure out our, our future state and make, make our software more lean. Anyone read this book? By Tom and Mary Poppendike. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, implementing Lean Software, uh, Tom and Mary Poppendike, they talk about the seven wastes. So, hands up, hands up if you know, anyone know uh, Tim Wood? Okay. Does anyone know, know who, what does Tim Wood stand for? Can't remember. Tim Wood stands for the seven wastes of manufacturing waste. Now I've got a little animation, so be, be, be careful because it's just going to jiggle it around into a table. You ready? There we go. Fantastic. So, was that <laughs> worth me spending an hour to animate that little thing? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe that was me over-processing, right? So maybe that was me adding waste. That didn't add any value. I could have just cut to the table and everyone would have been fine. Anyway. Uh, here's a lesson, what have I learned? I've learned that I'm just too, <laughs> too, too absorbed in my own work to notice where I'm wasting my own time. Okay, so this is how we have lean manufacturing wastes that the Toyota uh, manufacturing will, will focus on. So that book by Mary and Tom Poppendike will tell you about the lean development equivalent of how it applies in an office or a software, particularly a software development environment. The, the ones uh, that is significantly different is the overprocessing, relearning, uh, forgotten knowledge, which is something that I've, I've noticed a lot in, in some of our teams. We have a, particularly legacy systems. No one knows how it works anymore. That person no longer works at the company and you have to reverse engineer other, our own systems that we've already built. So relearning is, is different. I actually think there's more overprocessing uh, beyond that. I think I've, I've seen teams uh, who create rather complicated, including testing frameworks or architecture patterns, overcomplicating something beyond the need that we have at the moment. Oh, well, but I'm planning this in case we need it. I need to make a system more, more, more scalable and I'll make a really complicated architecture. Well, we don't need it, particularly not for an MVP. So keeping it simple, don't over-engineer something when you don't need it. Do that refactoring when you need it and keep uh, the iterations short. If you design new systems well, it's easier to repattern or recycle or, or move to new architectures without having to do the whole lot in a big monolith. If you are building monoliths, monoliths, that, that's why you want to get everything right at the beginning. But if you're working in modularized development teams, you can just roll it out and if you need to change it later because it's successful and it scales up beyond what you thought it was, but you want to get the feedback first. Okay, so overprocessing uh, is one of the ones that uh, is different. Um, Tom and Mary Poppendike recognize that these are the biggest two. If you don't do anything else, try and remove the waste on these two items. 
there was a, um, a, a fake news uh, that went around maybe 15, 15 years ago um, about overproduction and, and creating extra features. 64% uh, of features in our software are rarely or never used. That, that came from a, a keynote at a 2002 extreme programming conference where the Standish group reported that 64% of features are, are rarely or never used, but it was in the context of four projects, internal projects they had run and identified that waste. But they hadn't meant to imply that everyone has 64% of their features rarely or never used, but it did get everyone thinking. And I don't know that it was really a, a, a big Twitter uh, fake news feed back, uh, back in 2002, but certainly it's a, it got everyone thinking about are we really adding value or are we adding bloat? Okay, so those are the two that we want to focus on. Some of these things really need multiple teams to be involved. How can we remove the waste between teams if we don't involve both of the teams? So the things in red are the things that really need multiple teams to come together. The things in yellow are things that you can, you can solve and find that waste within your own team. Any queries, any questions? Okay, so I recognized late, late after I started trying to do value stream mapping that there's a clear separation here between things that relate to multiple teams and things that are more tactical and relate within your team. And it's so hard uh, to keep that separation and not to get into the grass and the weeds and getting into the nitty detail as you drill down into all the different types of the processes and the steps that can, oh, well, what about this and what about that? And you end up in the weeds and you really want to pull back out of a value stream. We're just looking at the big process and the movement between teams. It's at a strategic, strategic level, not at the process level where you've got 20 or 30 of those pink sticky notes on the wall. Within the tactical uh, process level mapping, you really want to focus on trying to remove those wastes Any, any defects, any reclarification, reclarification in uh, solution architecture, reclarification in our requirements, that's all rework, that's all waste. If we wrote them you know, clearly in our first, our first pass, if we had the right conversation or the right people with the right knowledge in that first conversation, we can remove some of this waste and reduce it at least if we can't completely eliminate it. So this is the process level. This is where we get into the real detail within your team, plot out your full process of everything that you do within your team, make sure you have everyone in the room and figure out how long things take and you have a conversation to figure out how can we improve this. It's a great exercise for a, a retrospective. Um, maybe it will take a, a first pass or another, a second pass to actually get some numbers and data together with that, but at least we can have a conversation to see, so how can we get this process better? But at a process level map, it's within the team. Okay, questions? Happy to move on? Okay. My problem wasn't within the team. All of my testing challenges seem to be caused by development, you know, having bugs, not getting the quality, seem to be the architecture, maybe some gaps in our requirements had to go and get clarified. So my focus was really trying to get this big picture. Okay. Looking at the, the big value stream map. Okay. So this is the, these are the things that I want to spot on my value stream map. Having created a current state of where are we now, these are the things that I want to look for to see how can we improve and then plan a way to get to the next, the next state, the next future state. So I'm going to put up on the screen a value stream map, and I want you to see if you can spot the wastes and see if you can, you know, see, if you can see any of these things on the, on the, on the board. So first impressions. <laughs> what what a mess. <laughs> what an absolute mess. Now, I know obviously you can't see a lot of the detail at the bottom. I don't think you need to. It shouldn't be too hard to spot. What the hell is that? <laughs> all right? That's all of our IT systems that, are, that we enter data into. So this might be our build server. There's a system we use for tracking bugs. There's a system we use for our um, architecture diagrams, and they're stored on a SharePoint site. There's another system we use for getting stuff out into production. Maybe there's some other systems that we use for um, going through our cab approval process. 
Now, by themselves, each of our teams along the bottom really only interact with one or two of those systems. But when you put it on a value stream map, and they say, wow, that is a huge mess. That's a ton of stuff that we have to do. Some of those lines have got a zigzag in them. That stuff that's automatically populated and is automatically entered into those systems. But the single solid lines, those are manual data entry. So while each of those teams is trying to look at this motion and how they're spending time doing other stuff, which isn't really adding value, when you put it on a value stream map, we see the big picture. Most of these systems aren't talking to each other. Maybe we have a conversation, how can we reduce all this manual data entry that all our teams have to do? Some of them maybe we can combine, maybe we can put some, some automation between them, maybe some of them we can remove, but there's a, there's a conversation. There's probably something else which stands out straight away from the back of the room, and that's, that's the next one, is all of that stuff. That's a lot of teams to go through. These are, these are process teams where you have to have some sort of handover between the teams. That's a lot of teams that get involved in delivering some software. Maybe we need to have a conversation about, can some of these teams be combined? What are these teams? Can we get some of them engaged earlier on so we don't have to hand something over later on? How can we get more efficiency between some of these teams? Do we have too many teams? Can we uh, maybe offsite some of those teams? We've also drawn on here some, uh, some backlogs of partially done work. So this could be, at the beginning, some backlogs. We've got some backlogs halfway down as well, maybe queuing up for testing activities and going into production. But our backlogs help us to spot those, uh, those queues and where we've got some, some challenges. Those are things we want to focus on to, re to reduce them. Are they first in, first out? Or is it like a supermarket backlog where I can pick and choose which of those things I want to do? Obviously, I choose all the easy ones and leave the hard ones that really add the value on the backlog for six months and then never see the light of day. So we really want to check and understand what are those backlogs and how we use those backlogs to make sure we are able to get things through that system and they don't stay in those backlogs for a long time. Okay. Process time and lead time. Uh, also on here so we can see how long things go through our, our workflow. These are the main uh, key metrics you'll see on every uh, um, value stream map. In software development, there's a difference between manufacturing, where the, the waiting time or the lead time is always at the beginning of that process. Once that process starts, they work on that, on that component and it goes out. In software development, we have lots of stopping and starting. I start work on it and I try, oh, I've got to go back and clarify something, I stop the clock. Then it comes back, now I've got to get approval for something, stop the clock. There's a lot of stop and starting, I've got meetings. So, we put the process and lead time above each other, and the, the, the process time is the actual time it took to do the work, and the lead time includes all of those bits in the middle where you were waiting for something. The, the lead time is still the overall duration, but the process time is the time it took you to actually do that activity. And we put them above each other because we want to make it really clear that the, the waiting time is inside that process it's not just at the front like it would be in a manufacturing uh, conveyor belt. Make sense? Cool. We also record on here our defects, percent complete and accurate. So we're also capturing how much of our stuff went through the first time or how much had to come back for clarification. Our requirements needed clarification. Our solution architecture needed more clarification. Uh, did, it, did it go through into production okay, or did the production team have some more questions that needed to get clarified? Were there any bugs from testing, the security testing? So the numbers in these uh, percent complete and accurate are representing how many of my downstream teams believe that my stuff is complete and accurate, and it's measured by the downstream teams. That's where you have that conversation. 50% of your stuff no, has bugs and issues, 50, really? 50%? Oh, okay. All right, okay. It's the downstream teams that, that set that number, not you. Okay, and you might need to multiply those together. If uh, no, you're the next, your next uh, box downstream, I say, yeah, we're happy with that. You know, 90% is all good. But it's only when it gets all the way down here that said, oh, that architecture diagram is useless. And it's all the way back again. So you need to maybe multiply those together to get really true what was complete and accurate. And it's one of the numbers we usually measure is how much stuff goes through the entire system first pass with not getting any rework at any point in that process. I think we've seen 
at least five of these uh, seven highlighted just on the Valley Stream map. So it really helps us to spot all of these wastes. The two that we haven't seen on that one were the, uh, the, the relearning and the overprocessing, and maybe that sits within your process level map within your teams. But it's also maybe visible within the, the, the process time or the cycle time. If things are taking a lot longer than you thought, well, maybe it's because we have to keep re-learning re or reverse engineering our stuff. So that one comes up potentially in your cycle time. Um, overproduction, extra features, that one can't really see that on that uh, value stream map, at least unless you've got the right um, uh, metrics in place to capture uh, the features you are adding and you're starting to get that feedback loop with the logs and the clicks to figure out, are we actually adding value? Um, are, those, are the features adding waste? So we really need to get to this level, get captured the telemetry to understand our real user patterns and start the next ex experiment. Without that, it's really hard to see that waste and our bloated features. The real difficulty that I've discovered is that once you've gone beyond that stage and you've got bloat, removing them, no one wants to touch that prickly fish, right? No one. There's, uh, there's always one customer. There's always one user who needs that feature. And you ne once it's there, that's waste. And it's so hard to get rid of it. It's hard enough to get time to build the features we want. I'm never going to get time to remove a feature that no one wants. That's just, that's just not going to happen. So we really want to focus on removing, uh, removing the bloat and getting it right, making sure we try those experiments and test the hypothesis that there is value before we add this in. Um, that's, just, that's just so hard. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna move on. I think we've uh, seen these, these next couple of slides about the, the current state and future state, and I wanna uh, talk a lot more about how to run the workshops to get a successful value stream. I, these are all numbers on, along here that I've made up because every, every team is going to be different. And the value in a value stream map is the conversation you have trying to draw this out and what does it mean for your team and your company and your organization. So um, I'd like to have more conversation about how to run the sessions, how to guide the, the teams to come up with the right numbers and the right metrics and the right decisions to make them better. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, and you might touch on this, but you seem to be using lead time and some time interchangeably. So and I mean, this might be my misunderstanding, but they're two quite different things. Um, I just can't see the overlap, overlap between process time, some time, and lead time. To me, lead time should be a concept of cash, that whole value stream. Is that me not understanding? Or? Each of these uh, teams can have their own lead time to get from the something coming in to get to something coming out of that team. Uh, you're right, you can at the organizational level. If, you, if we drew up one level up to the organization, that lead time could be for the IT department to come in through the IT department um, all the way through their system. There's an overall cycle time and lead time for how long does it take a PBI to get from start to done. Uh, you might maybe at the next, the next level up. Um, depends upon how many teams you've got and where those hand handoffs are. Uh, what's your thought on or your understanding of a process time and a cycle time? Uh, I mean, if I'm looking at a value, like a whole value stream, lead time for me would be the entry point to that uh, value stream and to the end, so that that whole concept of cash. And the cycle time would be uh, essentially that lead time for that for each kind of stage in that value stream. All right. But, I mean, I've seen them used interchangeably anyway. I haven't drawn on their last box where we add up all the numbers cool. and say, so overall, to get from this left-hand side to the right-hand side, add up all the numbers, and that gives us the overall totals. So you, yeah, you're right, I think you'd normally add those up and then you get a, a number at the end. But each of these are, are adding up, this is how long it takes to get through that stage, that's how long it takes to get to that stage, and we'll add up the total at the end. All right, good, good point. Um, I have seen cycle time and process time used interchangeably. Uh, Mary and Tom Poppendike would prefer perhaps the use of uh, process time over cycle time. Uh, cycle time makes more sense in a manufacturing environment where you, you, you've got a, a batch and it's a set batch of, of stuff that comes through all the time. Uh, they prefer the word process time to help reinforce it's the, the, the stopping and starting as well. Um, and it's not just a repeat of one cycle of, uh, maybe one cycle of testing, but I have to do another cycle of testing and a, and a third cycle of testing to get things you know, done. Um, lump all of that up, that's just your process time. 
Um, so they, I think they're trying to get um, process time uh, in uh, office and uh, services in, uh, environments and cycle time where that makes sense for us, uh, a batch of work. But they, yeah, mean, mean the same things. How long it took to, to get that work done. The, the lead time stays the same, it's the overall duration. But yeah, we should be adding them up at the end. Okay. All right. Hopefully most of us are somewhere in the middle here. Um, and we've got something that looks a bit like this with a, an engineering or a, an agile team in the middle. Uh, and maybe we'll spot uh, there's some other bits in here, other, other handoffs. Maybe we still have a cab approval process to get into production. And there's actually another team that sits in here. Um, maybe, we'll, maybe that will be part of this production team. They're not, they're not going to do anything unless they get that, that sign off. Uh, it depends upon how your team is organized and you want to have a conversation to understand where those different teams are, where are the handoffs um, without getting into the weeds of the, the individual processes themselves that happen with inside a team. Okay. All right, let's, let's see whether we can move forward into how we can get better at spotting this stuff and running a successful, uh, successful session. Karen Martin has a lot of information on her website, uh, lots of videos. I'll put a link, uh, I'll put that up again on, a, on another slide. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff on her site and it's really helpful when you're trying to apply value stream maps to software and service industries. Um, it does need time. It does need three days to do this correctly, to do this properly. That's a, that's a challenge by itself. If you think you can do it in half a day, you're joking. You need someone else to get involved. Uh, Karen's done hundreds of them. They've never been successful when you only try and rush it and do it in half a day. You need a full, a full three days. And if you struggle to get that, you need to gather some initial metrics to prove how much waste we have. And so that's a no brainer. But it does take a long time to map this stuff out. And it's really getting those people in the room to have the conversation is where we get the value. And you can't just do that when you're only having a, you know, a one hour, two hour meeting and then they're gone. Okay. Something else, big challenge is no, hey, my, this is where I tripped up, where I went wrong. Uh, you have to have the right people in the room. If you're going to do a value stream map talking about the different teams and how those different teams interact, you have to have the managers of those teams in the room to have the conversation. Particularly if you're starting to talk about merging teams together or how we can improve those efficiencies, uh, you need at least manager and manager's manager to be across what you're trying to do to make those decisions. How can we merge these IT systems together? I can't do that if it's just <coughs> me within my team. I can point out this, these issues, but we have to have the right people in the room. The process level map, when you get down into the detail, that's much easier for us you know, at the lower levels to, to get our manager involved and figure out how can we optimize our team. But value stream mapping, the big decisions, uh, need to have the big guys in the room. Karen Martin has never seen a successful value stream map presented to the uh, managers if the managers were not in the discussion and created it themselves. Never. Okay. This is one of the things, maybe this is my idea, I'm not going to get successful in implementing a value stream mapping because I don't think I've got the ability to have these kind of conversations or coach these conversations at this level. These are some tough conversations you have when you're in a value stream mapping exercise and you need a facilitator that can deal with executives at their level. And a lot of this may be you know, uh, not necessarily sensitive, but a lot of it is uh, it needs the decision makers to decide what to do, particularly when you're deciding the future state. What do we do? about making this better and, and making these processes um, more efficient. Something fairly similar, um, when you come to um, the lower levels and process level mapping just within your team, you also have some other challenges in trying to you know, negotiate and get the best value out of those sessions. You still have conflicts with teams trying to figure out, well, who does what? Well, that's not right. Oh, we don't do that. That's not the way to do it. You have to have a facilitator who can deal with the people doing the work at their level, who understands the challenges and can relate to those people at their level. 
this is another thing. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe uh, in my my experience in quality um, uh, anal uh, qu uh, QA and and testing, sometimes I maybe find this a little hard to facilitate a negotiation between these these teams that are arguing against themselves. You certainly want to try and find someone who's independent as much as you can. Get another consultant or someone else from another part of the business, so that you don't have some bias and steer it towards the way that you want. You need to have someone independent to try and get the trust um, and help the team coach them towards that conversation. At a value stream map strategic level, uh, you need a facilitator that has the trust um, and can relate to the executive team. And at that process level map, you need a facilitator that can relate to and has the respect of the development team. It all depends on that, really that facilitator skill. And this is my mistake. Uh, that I've recognized, uh, I'm gonna really struggle to get this together uh, and actually make the change. I need to find someone else who can help to set this up and talk to the right people. So running a value stream mapping workshop, there's a lot to do before that workshop in actually getting the right people engaged and getting their commitment. Are they serious about wanting to make change? Are they serious about removing waste and optimizing our process? I mean, this is big uh, transformational stuff. During the workshop, we need to get out of a classroom and don't think you're just gonna sit around the Visio diagram and draw it up on the spot. We have to go, go to the Gemba, go and see the actual work being done. And we do it twice, once on day one when we, when we look at the current state and understand what do you do? How do you do that? You enter that into three systems. I thought there was only one system. No, there's all these steps in that process you want the leaders to understand how long these things take by talking to the people and you go and visit their desks, talk to each team, talk to each of the, the, uh, the sales team, you can talk to the marketing team, you want to talk to the developers, the BAs, the testers, the security team. You want to talk to all of the people at their desks to understand how hard their work really is. On day two, you want to do the same thing again, but this time, having, having understood from day one what your current state is, you're going to have some different questions to go back to them. Would it work if we change this process this way? How about we, we make an improvement here? Is that, going to be, is that going to be easier for you? You go around the second time talking to the same people, but this time with a different set of questions, having seen where your waste is, you now have some more knowledge where you want to dive into some more specific details so we can figure out how it's going to help the teams. Maybe they'll reply back, no, that's not going to work. Uh, there's something here they haven't thought of. So do, do the Gemba twice. Uh, certainly we need some reinforcement afterwards uh, for those changes to be successful. I'd recommend that Toyota Carter book. It goes through the process of continuous improvement and setting one target milestone, doing a plan, do, check, act cycle and repeating this pattern to make sure that you're making progress and you get the people doing the work engaged in making those changes. It's not some managers coming up to say this is our future state, go fix the problem. You want the, the value stream maps to set those targets, having had the conversation with them going around doing the Gemba walks. The, the teams can now have their process level maps, knowing that the managers are on board with making some big changes. But you want the teams to then make those changes in their process level maps. Numbers only need to be good enough. We don't need to get really into the nitty gritty at the value stream map. As long as we can get a, you know, a good approximation, <laughs> that's about right. We don't need it too precise. Certainly in the value stream maps, when it's within your team, that's when you can get into the real detail about how many minutes or hours it takes to get something through. But at the value stream map, usually, usually hours, days is enough. We don't need to be too precise. So where, where are we now? Well. I initially proposed this as a, a workshop session um, when I first put this into the last uh, conference. And I was going to show how to create a value stream map in a Visio uh, diagram with live data connected up to a, a database or it could be a SharePoint site, an Excel spreadsheet, but we get some live data from an, um, an ODBC data connection. And these numbers can update in real time. And you can get that on a dashboard and have a real current state as of now and it will automatically refresh the, the, the data. So that was my pr initial proposal for last conference, but my initial feedback was that it's gonna be more helpful to understand how to create these maps and how to get into uh, the, the future state maps. But I can, I'm gonna, if I get enough 
uh, show of hands if this is going to be helpful. I can make a video of how to do this and get real data into Visio, um, or I can have a session at one of the other um, Agile meetups in Melbourne. If you're interested, anyone uh, keen to see how that might work? Okay, all right. Well, I'll, I'll talk to some of the Agile meetup groups then, and I'll, I'll show you how you can get real data coming through into a Visio diagram and draw these up in real time. Um, obviously, that's after this is the, 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 the change and why I had to change my presentation before I, uh, I came to the session today. Um, is that this is after you've done the workshops and you've created the map and you've drawn it up in a Visio diagram nice and neatly. Now you can plug in the data. The real challenge is, well, how do we even get to this uh, value stream map in the first place? Well, lots of our tools are getting better. Um, recently, uh, Visual Studio Team Services started to add some widgets so that we can see our lead time and cycle time for our PBIs. This is the overall grand total, the averages. And I like these ones, actually, maybe a little bit more than those value stream maps because I can see the trend over time. I can see, I can see the variation, some big differences in here between the size of our PBI. Some of them obviously got stuck in here for a long time and others went through really fast. But I can see the trends over time. Are we getting better or are we getting worse? This is a scrum team, not, not too bad. Uh, two, two weeks, and so on average it's 11 days to get through. So we still have some stuff not finished in the sprint and some stuff goes on to the next sprint. But 11 days on average to get something through the, through the Scrum team is not too bad for our, our current level of, 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 uh, of projects. Um, 26 days from when something gets onto the backlog to when it's done. Now, there is a, a lot of challenges. And I did like um, the session yesterday on data, um, how we can make sure we get everyone's buy-in and agreement on the data that, and metrics that we are capturing. Because as soon as people recognize that we're getting monitored and measured on these metrics. We'll find ways either to work around them if we don't believe them or we don't trust them. Lead time from when it is created to when it's completed, that's easy. What I'll do is I will delete the item on the backlog and recreate it to start the clock again. That's easy. You want to measure me? I can get that number right down. So there needs to be this trust and you need that, that conversation that these numbers are helpful and they're not going to get used or abused against you. Um, but these are, these are the numbers we want to capture, lead time, uh, process time. Lots of the tools that we have at the moment are getting much better at surfacing the starter up, and this is ones that are, that are tracking it over time. So I actually quite like this, even perhaps a little bit more now than, uh, than a value stream map where we see the whole thing. This doesn't give us the big picture, though. We're still missing the big, the big view. OK. So uh, last couple of, of thoughts then. I, I am still trying to get this quality and efficiency across the full SDLC and across other teams. And I do need to start working on uh, other project managers, other leaders to get this process set up in place. Need to get that buy-in. I need to recognize it. I'm not the person to hold those sessions. I need to help them understand. Let's get some consultancy in. Someone independent that can work with those uh, managers and senior manage managers at their level. Um, it's not something that I'm going to be able to coach those kind of conversations on my own. The State of DevOps report this year had a whole chapter on transformational leadership. And the outcome from their, uh, their research is that transformational change needs leadership. Uh, without um, transformational leadership, uh, teams are 50% less likely to be highly successful but they also found that the top 10% of leaders performed no better on average than average. So it's, <laughs> you can't do it top down either. It does need uh, both top and bottom buy-in to the same process to make any change. I'll leave you again with a final, a final thought that whenever you're trying to do value stream maps, the symbols on the charts are not that important. The actual numbers you draw in and the cycle time is not that important. It really is in the conversation you have trying to understand where does our time go? How do you do that process? Why is it taking so long? Let's have that conversation and spot those seven wastes. Okay, look up uh, Tom and uh, uh, Mary Poppendike's book and refresh yourself on what those seven wastes are. I highly recommend that you look at Karen Martin. She's got loads of videos, lots of Lots of uh, detailed videos uh, on how to run these workshops. So a lot of that is more in the office and service industry and less about manufacturing. So go and check out her website. Um, and those are the three books uh, that I recommend that you, that you read.
Thank you, everyone. Hopefully that's answered some, uh, some questions. Do you have any questions for me? Process level mapping? Uh, two days. You still want to have a day for the current state and understand well, really where do we spend all of our time. It will then take a while to figure out, um, so where are the impediments? Have we got enough metrics, enough uh, detail in those numbers? Where are those bottlenecks? And then you need to plan out the future state and have another conversation. Is this right? Can we optimize some of this stuff and move it around a bit? And then plan the actions. Who's going to do what? How are we going to make it happen? Not just come up with a future state and then walk away. It's not going to work. So even for a process level map, you want a two-day workshop within your team. So maybe that's a, a session you have or a spike within your sprint. Now, as a retro item, let's, let's do a retrospective on our process level map, but we'll block out time and have a, a, a two-day session in the next sprint. Um, you obviously need to, to plan and get everyone's agreeing to do that, and that's, that's also hard. To, to get all that agreement. It's, it's the, same, the same conversations, the same challenges that the, the senior team apply to the lower levels as well. What strategies have you seen work uh, getting that support of the value streams that you look for the value stream maps? I've, uh, I've not experienced it within the few companies that I've worked at, but I am taking a lot of feedback from Karen, who's done it in hundreds of companies and organizations. I'd really need, I'd really need to find uh, a way to get consultants in and a way to influence them, because I, you know, I'm not the right person to be able to have that conversation at that level. Um, they need someone else in to try and help uh, set that process up. Um, you need to, that, perhaps that transformational leadership was important as well from that state of DevOps report. You need, you need managers who actually want to, to make this change. Um, so surfacing the data is, is one thing. I, I can service the data and show this is how long things take. But Karen has never seen that work unless the managers were involved in making that process level map, making the, um, sorry, the, the value stream map. Yeah, but I'd need to get, get external consultants in who have the skills and who have the trust at that level. There's another question on this side. Great. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Really, really great. Oh, wow. I um, really love the way you pitched that. That was fantastic. And really, yeah, that was really good. That was really inspiring. I, I enjoyed it.